I belong to a garden club in Morris. We have about 20 members and one of the big areas of discussion is when to clip back and clean up hostas. Some of the members say fall because they have more time then and the hosta leaves get so mushy if left till spring. Some of the members say they clean them up in the spring in order to leave plant residue to hold snow for protection over winter. Let's get this answer and lots more good hosta growing information on today's show. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided by Heartland Motor Company, providing service to Minnesota and the Dakotas for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA, pioneers in bringing state-of-the-art technology to our rural communities. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. And by friends of Prairie Yard and Garden, a community of supporters like you who engage in the long-term growth of the series. To become a friend of Prairie Yard and Garden, visit pioneer.org forward slash PYG. About five years ago, I attended a garden day and one of the speakers did an excellent talk on growing hostas. Last year I contacted her to do a show with me for Prairie Yard and Garden. We were all set and then a windstorm came along and blew down a tree in her yard, crushing her hostas. Well that put the kibosh on that show, but when I called Jackie Fremming this year she said, sure, come on over for a visit. Thanks, Jackie, for letting us come. Yeah, nice. And this this year, the weather is is cooperating. It's, it's no storm so far. <laughs> what is your background? My background is in mycology. If you know what that is, it's the study of mushrooms. But um, when we moved to Minnesota, I was looking for a job, and there was a job with extension. I didn't know what extension was, but I applied. I got the job, and it turned out that part of my job was coordinating the master gardening program in Crow Wing County. So that's how I got connected with plants. But yes, mushrooms. And if you look around, you're going to see a lot of little decorations related to mushrooms because that was my field. That's what I went to school for. How did you get started growing hostas? I remember the very first time I saw a hosta, if you believe that, because they don't grow in Puerto Rico. That's where I'm from. So I never saw one. And then from there, I moved to Texas. From there, I moved to Indiana. And it was in Indiana in my 20s when I, we went to a restaurant. And the landscape in front of the restaurant, there were these plants that were green and white and so pretty. And I was like, what are those plants? Well, they were hostas. So now, you know, move forward in the future. I started working with Extension. I started working with Master Gardeners. And then I knew what hostas were and how many of them, and I got hooked. How many cultivars do you have in your yard? You know, I get that question a lot. I'm not going to count. <laughs> <laughs> First, it's hard to figure out. Plus, I'm sure there's a lot of people that have way more than me. So I'm not going to say, well, I have 150 and you have 200. Let's say that I have plenty of them. <laughs> Where do you get most of your hostas from? All kinds of garden centers, plant sales. It's great to know master gardeners because they are very generous people and they like to divide their plants and give away. And many of the hostas that I have have been given to me by master gardeners, which adds an element to the plant. In addition to say, oh, here's fashionista, 
I remember the master gardener that gave it to me. So it's, it has like a more like a, a human connection to other people just every time that you look at those plants. Are hostas a popular perennial? Very popular. They're easy to grow. They tolerate shade, dapple shade. Some of them may tolerate a little more sun. Um, they tend to grow in zone three to nine. So here in Brainerd, we are zone three. I can tell you southern part of the United States, Miami, chances are you will not see hostas. They need a dormant period over winter. Hey, a good thing of living in Minnesota, we can grow hostas and they grow well. So, What are some of the different shapes of hostas that you have and what does that mean? Shapes, if you're talking about the whole plant, there's two basic shapes. There is the mound shape, so it goes kind of like this, or the vase shape, so it goes from the bottom and it grows up. So depending on the landscape, what, are you, you know, what you're trying to, to accomplish, the back of a border, the front of a border, a mound shape like golden tiara might be better than regal splendor, like this one is a vase shape. So those are the two basic plant shape. Jackie, what are some of the different leaf shapes of hostas? There are four basic types of shapes. Um, you have the heart shape, there's also oval shape, um, lens shape, which is just really long and skinny, and we also have the cup shapes, and those are kind of cute. One great example is a big one, drinking gourd, and I do have that one. You obviously must be able to have different colors, too. Yes. If we're talking about solid colors, so you have your solid green, solid blue, solid gold or yellow, and now there's white hostas, which is more of a novelty plant. Well, I've learned so much already, but can we go and learn more? Yes, let's go and look at the hostas. is an essential ingredient in so many dishes and recipes. Cooking oil adds texture to our food and makes it flavorful and rich, but too much can be unhealthy and sometimes we need to watch our calories and find alternatives. Fortunately, there are some alternative plant-based oils that deliver the same great taste but without the harmful saturated fat. Sunflower oil is one of those. Low in saturated fat, sunflower oil helps lower cholesterol and reduces other health risks and is an excellent source of vitamin E. That's why I'm here at Smoothie Farms near Pierce, Minnesota, where they produce their own locally grown sunflower oil, flavored and infused cooking oils, and their very own Smoothie's microwavable and gourmet popcorn. Tom and Jenny Smoothie have been running this diverse family farm since 1998, where they also raise cattle for farm-to-table beef and infuse their sunflower oil with goat's milk for skin care products. We we're buying a lot of protein, so we decided to uh, make our own protein on the farm, and we came up with sunflowers. The oil was actually going to be the byproduct. After three months, we went into food grade, and the oil we started bottling went into uh, farmers markets with it and the whole thing took off from there. Standard cooking oils, high in saturated fats, have been in kitchen cupboards for generations. But the sunflower provides an exceptional quality and flavorful oil that should be a staple in your own kitchen. Sunflower oil is actually very heart healthy because of the high monounsaturated fats and the low saturated fats. So we like to tout it as being the healthy alternative to your other cooking oils. Beautiful sunflowers, great to look at, great for our pollinators, and good for you. Consider trying sunflower oil with your favorite recipes, or the next time you have movie night, your heart, skin, and your taste buds will thank you. Mary, here is one of the best hosta beds that I have. I have others, but this one happens to be the perfect location. It's filtered, dappled, shade, and it's perfect. 
Um, I think I started this one about 10 years ago when we moved here. And over time, I moved plants around and I would say that it's pretty much done. As you can see, we have taller um, cultivars in the back, especially the face shape upright, like the Montana, shorter, uh, more mound shape in the front, like uh, Fire Island. But as you can see here, you can see all the colors we mentioned. We mentioned solid green, solid blue, gold, yellow. Oh no, we don't have white. So if we look here, this one is August Moon and it's considered to be in the class or the group of yellows and golds. The thing with yellows and golds, the more sun they get, especially morning sun, the brighter they will be, the more gold, more yellow. So if you have one like August moon in full shade, it will tend to be more green. Same with the big one over there, the summon substance, very common, very popular. That is also considered to be in the gold and yellow group. Those two, those are blue. And we also have solid green and is on the other side of the bed and is a new one that I planted last year and it's called Sugar Snap and it's solid green. How do you know with all of these available, how do you know which ones you should try? You hear from Master Gardens which one they like. You also can go to the American Hostess Society. They have the Hostel of the Year. They have a list. So to be nominated as a Hostel of the Year, you have to assume that it's a good cultivar to try. So how do you know which hostas to use in which situation? Usually, if you're talking about amount of sunlight, uh, the green ones are better for sunnier location. The blue ones will benefit from shade. And also the blue ones, try to have them in an area that is away from traffic. Because the way they get the, glue, the blue color, there is a waxy coating that if you remove that, it's gone for the season. I learned that the hard way. At the other house, I used to have a really big blue hosta right next to my rain barrel. So then all of a sudden I'm thinking, what is going on with the hosta? It's like half of the hosta is green. Well, it was me walking by the hosta and rubbing against the hosta to get water from the rain barrel that I was removing the waxy coating that it was giving the hosta the blue color. Now here is at the edge, but we walk, we don't walk by the hosta, so it's fine. But if you have a tight walkway where you're going to be rubbing against the hosta, don't plant a blue one. So what varieties can you put or what should you look for as a border plant? Probably you want shorter plants, not too tall, and the ones that grow more like a mound shape rather than vase. One really good example, golden tiara, and I have a row of them going to next to steps going down to the lake. How about a ground cover? What kind should you get for that? Actually, golden tiara is an option too. Twist of lime is, is another one because it's very short it spreads, the clump spreads. So obviously you will have to plant more than one plant in the location, but if you have, let's say five, seven, then eventually with time, you can have an area covered with just hostas. Are there some varieties that have a fragrant flower? Yes, and it's funny that you ask because sometimes the name of the hosta will give you a hint. So I have a hosta called Fragrant Bouquet so guess what? Yes, the flowers tend to be more aromatic than other hostas. That was another source of discussion in our garden club is, should you leave the blooms on the hostas or should you clip them off? I will say it's a personal preference. It's whatever you prefer. I prefer to cut them and I know some people will be like, oh, but the hummingbirds love them and that's okay. I have plenty of other flowers for hummingbirds, but Especially some hostas, the flowers are really pretty, like uh, blue mouse ears. The flowers stay short, they're bright purple, I mean, they're pretty. Some hosta flowers are not so pretty, so as soon as they start blooming, I cut them down. Do hostas form seeds? 
Yes. And I haven't done it myself, but I know master gardeners that they collect seeds, they plant them. Um, you remember that dormant period that we said that hosta needs? So hosta seeds, they need that stratification period. So what she did is um, she can either put it in the fridge over the winter or she put them in an unheated garage over winter. Now, the thing with starting seeds from uh, hostess from seeds is there's not gu a guarantee that the baby plants will look like the mom. So the variegation can be different. And what she did, and, and she did a lot of hostess from seeds, she said about 95% of the seedlings will be solid green, even if the hosta where they came from had a variegation. So maybe out of 100, five will look like the mother plant. So it's, there's nothing wrong with it. You're propagating hostas from seeds. It's just that if you, want, you were looking for that variegation, if you were looking for something to look like June or striptease or any of those, chances are you're gonna end up with green hostas. So when the breeders make a new hosta, is it by seed or how else? Seeds is time consuming. It's a time consuming process. So what they do is tissue culture. So they develop sports by taking tissue from a hosta that looks a little different and they do tissue culture. So in the lab with big setup, they produce a lot of plants and that's how they start new plants. Like for example, in these flower beds, um, we have striptease and we have gypsy rose. Well, gypsy rose is a sport striptease. So at one point a hybridizer noticed that striptease maybe had a leaf that was a little different and they took that portion of the plant, they did tissue culture, they developed a new plant, they gave it a name, Gypsy Rose, they applied for a patent and for 20 years they collect you know revenues from that plant that they developed. But it's, it's from a small genetic mutation from a plant. Can you use hostas in containers? Yes, and I've done it in a few years. Um, this year I didn't do that, but you can. You just want to make sure that it's a deep enough container, not too shallow, at least five, six inches deep. And at the end of the growing season, if you want to save the plant, you can either take it out of the container and put it in the garden, planting, or you can bury the entire pot in the garden, but chances are because of our winters, there's no guarantee that the plant will survive if you leave it in the pot. This has been so interesting, but I'd like to learn more about planting and maintenance and care. Yes, I have another flower bed. Let's go and see it. I have a question. I like the look of evergreen trees, but I don't want anything too large. What do you recommend? Well, for that purpose, dwarf conifers might fill the niche. Uh, if you don't want a big old white pine or a big Norway spruce that'll take up half your yard, you could plant a dwarf conifer. And which one depends on the size of your yard. They come in various shades of green and other colors like yellows and blues. So they could be real nice accents in the garden. Like two of my favorites are right back here, dwarf creeping Colorado blue spruce. So instead of a tapered cone, you have one that just spreads along the ground if you want a ground cover. Another one is uh, the weeping Norway spruce back there, which comes out in the springtime with yellow leaves, which last through much of the year, and then they turn green as the season progresses, and it's got this nice weeping effect, and it won't take up a whole lot of space. And if a weeping tree is not something that you'd like. Dwarf conifers come in many other forms. There's a lot of very small, tight, rounded ones or uh, small cone-like ones like the Korean fir, one called Icebreaker, that's very slow growing and has silvery new growth and might reach two or three feet in 10 years, you know, so it'll stay nice and compact. You could have really creeping dwarf conifers, especially different kinds of junipers that will form a good ground cover uh, to help keep the weeds down too. So one good tall narrow plant is the uh, weeping white spruce, Picea glauca pendula. And we've got a very nice specimen here at the Arboretum that's about 20 feet tall and only about 
five feet wide or four feet wide, so it would work very well for a tight space where you do have room to grow up. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chaska, dedicated to welcoming, informing, and inspiring all through outstanding displays, protected natural areas, horticultural research, and education. Jackie, if people want to plant hostas, when is the best time to do that? Um, either spring or fall, it's whatever, whenever you had the time. I prefer to do it in the spring. The only thing with a disadvantage of doing it in the spring is like, there's been times that I got a new hosta in the spring, I go to the flower bed, I'm putting it in the ground and I'm like, oops, wait, there's somebody, something coming up. So that's one disadvantage of doing it in the spring that you didn't know something was there. But spring and fall, both are good times to do it. Probably avoid the middle of summer when it's too hot because it's too much stress on the plant. Okay, if you want to divide hostas, when is the best time to do that? Okay, before I tell you the time, the best time I had to say, there's a good reason for dividing a hosta and a bad reason for dividing a hosta, like a right reason and a wrong reason. A right reason is because you want to propagate the hosta. Instead of having one clump, you want three clumps or five clumps. But if you tell me that you're dividing your hosta because it got too big <laughs> for the location, I would say that's the wrong reason for dividing a hosta. You just put the hosta in the wrong location. But the best time to divide, again, in the spring, is a really good time when there's barely coming up from the ground. You can see the clump, but the, the leaves haven't opened. You can divide them then, yeah. Is there a certain kind of soil that you can use or have to use for them? Um, they like uh, well-drained, uh, loamy soil, probably not too sandy. If your soil is too sandy, maybe you want to amend with compost. But for the most part, they're very forgiving plants. They're very low maintenance. I have a hosta. It was a golden tiara that it was showing signs of maybe a virus or something. I threw it in the woods. It's growing in the woods. So yes, they are very easy to grow plants, yeah. Should you fertilize hostas? If you want to, yes, you can. It can be a basic fertilizer 10, 10 and 10. Apply early in the season, you know, at the beginning of the spring. And if, if it is something that you're doing foliar application, the liquid kind, um, halfway through the summer, stop doing because you want the plant to stop growing and, and take more energy to the roots. And that goes for many perennials. You know, you don't want to be fertilizing perennials late in the season. Annuals, yeah, perennials, no. Should you put mulch around the hostas? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> so it depends. Have you heard that from master gardeners? <laughs> it depends. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have any slug damage, if you don't see any holes in your hostas, Yes, add mulch, organic mulch, shredded leaves, shredded bark. It will reduce weeds. It will conserve moisture in the soil. But if you start seeing hostas with slug damage, which are holes on the leaves, remove the mulch. Um, they're hiding on the, the mulch, yeah. What other things can you do if you have slugs to get rid of them? Um, remove any place where they can hide. The mulch is one obvious one. A lot of times is if you have decorations, if you have rocks, they will hide under that. But what I do is I put down granules for slugs at the beginning of each growing season. How about deer? I've got deer at my place. What do I do for them? You had to spray. Or, I mean, if you have a fencing area where you have the hosses, that will be ideal. Otherwise, what they recommend is whatever you use, whatever repellent you use, to switch it throughout the growing season. Don't use the same spray, you know, from May through October, it's switch it. I see in your beds that you have other plants planted in besides hostas. What are some of these companion plants? I have coral bells, that's a really good option. Our virginia is another one, but the one that I really like and is right here in front of us, pulmonaria. 
really fuzzy leaves, the deer will not eat them. And they have really pretty flowers early in the spring. So when nothing else is blooming, pulmonaries, um, also known as lungsworth, is they're blooming. Do you need to water the hostas and the other plants quite often? Um, well, these last few summers have been really bad, especially here in Brainerd, but I'm sure all across the state we have been low on, on rainfall. So I water, I water quite often. I try to do it early in the morning and I try to water at the base of the plants. I try to avoid overhead watering, especially with the blue hostas and, and some of them. Um, so if you can remove the nozzle of your house and then just go straight at the bottom of the plant, that's much better than overhead watering with your nozzle, yeah. <laughs> well, now you have to answer the question in our garden club. Should you clean them up in the fall or in the spring? Personal choice, <laughs> whatever you prefer. I clean them in the spring because yes, first the more plant material is there, maybe the more snow will accumulate, extra winter protection. Plus in the spring, I know where the plants are because I can tell where the dead leaves are. So when I'm cleaning it out, I'm like, oh yes, on the ground, there's something there that should be coming up. Jackie, what are your three most favorite hostas and why? That's not a fair question. Isn't that like asking which kid, which of your kids is your favorite one? But I, if I have to pick, um, obviously Empress Wu, which is right here next to us, and it's just because of the size. I mean, look at the size of that one. Um, but I also like the mini ones, the mouse ears. And there's so many of them, they have the blue mouse ears, the laughing mouse ears. I mean, you, I go from the really big ones to the really little ones, but some of them are really, really nice. And, and every year they come up with new ones. Well, this has been marvelous. Thank you so much for teaching us all about the hostas. Well, it's, you know, I enjoy talking about hostas, so welcome anytime. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided by Heartland Motor Company, providing service to Minnesota and the Dakotas for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA, pioneers in bringing state-of-the-art technology to our rural communities. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. And by friends of Prairie Yard and Garden, a community of supporters like you who engage in the long-term growth of the series. To become a friend of Prairie Yard and Garden, visit pioneer.org forward slash PYG.